I hadn't seen Robert in years. You know, I, his son David's a year older and his daughter Beth's a year younger and we grew up together in youth camps and, and everything. Hey, I had just a great visit and uh, uh, Brother Robert and I talked about this in particular, but I remember one time, uh, well, when I was a little boy, 11 years old, I uh, had put a, I had a paper route, that's the only reason why I had a quarter. But I put a, put a quarter in one of those little machines and turned the knob, you know, and the little plastic ball comes out and there was a rubber snake about this long. Kind of, kind of looked like a little copperhead or something. And, uh, and uh, I remember one day there was a friend of my dad's visiting and I had no clue that he had a phobia about snakes and I snuck up behind him and put it on his shoulder and uh, he about went to the hospital with a heart attack. And my mama said, young man, if anything like that ever happens again, you will not see that snake ever. I said, yes, ma'am. Well, a couple weeks later, I don't know, I don't remember if it was a revival or what, but uh, I'm sitting in church and let's see, we were over on this side of the church. We were about four or five rows from the back there at Oakline over there across from the, the elementary school in uh, that building. And, and I'm sitting there, uh, I'm sitting right on the edge, and David Moore sitting right next to me, and then Elizabeth, and then Ben. And it's during prayer. And we're praying, and David elbows me. I look at him, he says, You got that snake with you? Yeah. Reached in my pocket, pulled out, handed it to him, and he turned around and he laid that snake perfectly underneath his mother. And then we start giggling. Because we knew what was going to happen. We got so excited. The prayer ended, and Elizabeth, she went to sit down, she turned, she saw the face, and was, I have not seen that snake since. You know, it's a, it's great to remember the past. And Ben and I talked about that and, and how wonderful, wonderful it was. But you see, here Israel was broken. People had been hauled off into captivity. Some had been bought back out of slavery and, and, uh, and the city was in ruins and Nehemiah had come to rebuild. Because I'll be honest, when, when, when our people are gone, it hurts. And it hurt. It really did. It hurt me when I was talking with Brother Ben Moore yesterday, knowing that he no longer comes here. It really hurts when we see that that somehow the world has dispersed a family that God had put together, people that had invested their, their lives, their time, their efforts, their talents, their time and their all, they've given it to Jesus, and now they, they've gone elsewhere. It hurts. And that's the reason we need to rebuild because there are some of those that still need to be brought back from the captivity because some of them that have left go, do not go to church anywhere. And that's the ones we focus on. So they started rebuilding, and uh, and as you know, they uh, they faced opposition. If we go to chapter four, we're going to start with verses one through three, and we're going to read through there, and we're going to stop a little bit. We'll get through the chapter before we're done, but that's as far as I'm going to go here in the beginning. Uh, verses one through three. Chapter 4, are you there yet? I hate it when my kids used to say, was I, are we there yet? <laughs> Reading from the NLT, Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think 
that they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, <laughs> that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. What we need to learn from the beginning is that we need to know our opposition. Sandballot, Tobiah, outsiders, people trying to control what was going on. We need to know our opposition. And if we're going to know our opposition, the first thing we need to do is to identify who is our opposition. Who is against us? And let me give you a quick sub-point to go with that. Don't put it up there yet. Uh, what I need you to know, if you do not get anything else out of the sermon today, get this. This is revolutionary. This is life-changing. This will change your family. This will change our congregation. This will change our city, our state, our nation, our world. If God's people will get this one point, our enemy is not people. Paul said in Ephesians 6.12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirit in the heavenly places. Our enemy never has been and never will be people. It's wrong thinking. Selfish thinking. Just as there is a God, when we allow Him to direct our life, He does that. If we choose not to let God direct our life, then we are making the other choice. There is no in-between. We choose to let the ruler of the evil world direct our life, no matter what we do. That's our choice, is one or the other. Our enemy is not people. Let me see if I can give you a for instance. Church I pastored once, lived right next door to it, and and every morning I would uh, I would walk. I had a two mile walk mapped out that where I would uh, um, I would walk for my health, for my spiritual health, and for my mental health. Threefold, right? You do know that we have, we serve a threefold God. We're created in His image. We are threefold beings. And God's message is always threefold. It will always speak to our, our heart. Uh, it will always talk, talk to our mind, our body, and our spirit. There's a, there's a lesson there for all three, always. If there's not a lesson for all three, then it's not God's Word. That's one way we can tell. So, okay, uh, I, I'm walking. and what I, I had a map out. I'd walk through the neighborhood, and I, w I would pray for every house in that neighborhood and the families that lived there. And I would go walking by early when they were just getting up, starting to get ready for work and everything. And, and, I, walked in the, and I couldn't walk down every street, but when I would pass a street, I would look down it, and I'd pray for every house down each, each street. But my path always took me through downtown, so I would pray for all the businesses. That God would pour His blessing down upon them. And as I was walking, I would walk past this place that was the night spot in town. Three blocks from the church, from the house. And every Saturday night, I could hear it at my house. I'm not complaining. I like music. And it was loud enough I could hear it. You could also hear the sand volleyball tournaments going on and just party time and, and people reaching for something to fulfill were, were converging on there every week. So when I walked by, I prayed for this place. But I didn't pray that God would close them down. I didn't pray that God would strike them down, that He would ruin their business. I prayed blessings. I said, Lord, would you... Just bless this business so much that they make so much money that they retire and close the doors. 
rather than attack the people, I prayed blessings on the people so that God's blessing would shut the door. Well, I shared it with the congregation one Sunday and they laughed just like you did. And I thought it was because of the way that I was praying. But I found out afterwards that sitting on this side about four rows from the back was his aunt and his cousin and his family. And sitting over this side, two rows from the back, was his mom and dad and his wife and son and daughter. But it did not change the way I prayed. I continued that prayer every day, walking past, praying God's blessings on them. And I want you to know that his wife and son I led to Jesus Christ and baptized them. And I built a relationship with him. I I never was able to win him, but he would come and he would help work on the church. And if we needed anything, he was quick to help because we built a relationship. You see, when uh, when we attack people, we build walls. Now, I know we're rebuilding the walls, so don't get them confused. Later on, we're going to find out exactly what we're doing by building this wall, but not today. But when we attack people, it's divisive. When we allow our words to diminish someone else, it's divisive. Every time we we speak to an issue and we say, oh, they're just stupid. My grandson was like, oh, you said stupid. But every time we do that, we are attacking people. And Jesus said that we will be held accountable for every idle word we speak. When we speak negative to people, we are attacking people and they are not the enemy. Speak blessing. Speak blessing. Because you see the truth here that the enemy is not Sanballat. The enemy is not Tobiah. The enemy is not Gershom or, or the Arabs or, or, or the, any of those people. None of those are the enemy. The enemy is wrong thinking. The enemy is a wrong theology. The enemy is uh, uh, the powers of the evil world that control. And that's what we need to attack. Not people. So we've got to get that. We've got to get that down into our hearts and our soul. Matter of fact, Jesus said, if you call your brother a fool, you are in danger of hellfire. So remember, our enemy is not people. And really, that's what that old saying means. Love the sinner, hate the sin. But we literally got to do it. We cannot attack. If we're going to know our enemy, then we also need to know what is the nature of our opposition. Well, the first thing that I see with, in, in identifying our opposition is that Sanballat flew into a rage. Rage is, a, is one of the first Telltale signs of opposition. And rage comes from those who don't get their way. I, I, I want to do it my way. Uh, you guys are wrong. And any time in the church when there's problems, it's because somebody doesn't get their way and they fly off into a rage. I, I've seen it. Matter of fact, I know of a church that in a business meeting one time they had to call the police to protect the life of the pastor. True story. True story. You see, it wasn't people. The enemy was in a rage because God was trying to do something and the enemy didn't want it to happen. So we must, conf- we must know who the enemy is and recognize it right off because the first th- for the first thing that happened is rage and then he went into a rant. When people start ranting on something that they don't like or something that uh, they see that they think is wrong, you can know they may be right on the subject 
but their heart is wrong. And that's opposition. You can be right and be totally wrong. Yeah, you can. Thank you. <laughs> you can be right and be totally wrong. But the rage leads to a rant. And when that doesn't work, they turn into ridicule. And that was the, the process that followed here as they were building the wall. So let's read on verses 4 through 11. Then I prayed, Hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At last, the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites, Ashdodites, heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there's so much rubble to be moved. We'll never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. Step two is we need to face our opposition. Whatever it is in our lives personally that we're battling against, we got to face it. Sometimes that covers admitting it and suffering the consequences. Sometimes it means that we just stand. But there's a way there is a way that we can face our opposition and Nehemiah teaches us here because the first thing that we need in order to face our opposition is our weapons. And we have some great weapons that we find here and the first weapon is prayer. Prayer is very, very important. That's where it all begins. There's a great story where Jesus, uh, His disciples, uh, uh, Jesus came up and it, there was a there was a a boy that was uh, it had a demon and uh, the disciples had tried to cast it out just like they had seen Jesus do and they couldn't do it and Jesus came upon the scene and and the father says your disciples tried but they couldn't and Jesus said well anything is possible to those who believe and he said I believe help my unbelief and Jesus cast out the demon and then when they got off later by themselves, the disciples came up and said, Well, Jesus, why couldn't we do that? We did it just the way you did it, just like you showed us. We followed the steps, A, B, and C. We did it just like you said do it. How come we couldn't do it? And Jesus said, You can't do these things without much great prayer. That's in Mark 9, 29. Jesus replied, This kind can be cast out only by prayer. And some manuscripts say, And fasting. Before we can ever go to battle, we've got to do our battle on our knees. We've got to cry out to God and open our hearts and unburden ourselves. Let Him know everything about it. It's the greatest defense that we have against the opposition is to call upon the name of the Lord. And I really like this next one. What I see in the people here is they were people of great resolve. Resolve. It's carpet cleaner, right? The dictionary defines resolve as decide firmly on a course of action. You gotta have a plan. You gotta have a plan. Decide firmly. 
This is what I am going to do. I will not turn back. I brought with me this morning uh, a Broadman hymnal because the song is not in Church of God hymnals. It's a great song. Written by Palmer Hartsoul. And it says, I am resolved to no longer linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what He saith, do what He willeth. He is the living way. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still I will enter in. Great old hymn with a great, great, great message. I am resolved to no longer linger. Resolve, it seems to be something that has totally disappeared in our society. What's that? You need those words. There's two more verses. I just read three. But we need to be people of resolve. This is what I'm going to do no matter what. Uh, 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 the uh, African folk song that, that we sing a lot says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. That's resolve. We used to sing it in the church of God as I'm going on. I'm going on until the final triumph. I'm going on. Resolve. We've got to have a resolve. We've got a game plan. Christ has given us a game plan. We've got to follow it through. No turning back. I'm going forward. This is what we're going to do. This is, a, this is my God. This is a, my people. And this is my ministry. And this is where we're going. Nothing can dissuade me from doing what God has called me to do. I am resolved. It's a great word. Because we have a course of action and we cannot be moved. Another great song, I shall not be moved. You know, there was a lot of songs written about resolve. And we need to bring it back among God's people. And my favorite line in there is, friends may oppose me. Foes may be set me, but still I will enter in. We've got a work to do and nothing can stop us. That's another song. Life's a song, folks. Life's a song. <laughs> yes, it is. So we, our weapons are prayer, resolve, and passion. Now, do not mistake anger for passion. I'm serious. People go off into a, a rant and a rage just like sand ballad, and we say, oh boy, they're really passionate about that. No, they're not. Passion does not cause us to be angry. Passion calls us to action. We'll do something. I can't do much, but I'm going to do it because I have passion about that. Jesus Christ, when He would see the, the people that were hurting, and Scripture says He had compassion. The very word means with passion. With passion, he met their needs. He was called into action. Well, well, what about, Pastor, when Jesus ran the money changers out of the temple? He wasn't angry. He wasn't angry. As you read the Bible, he took a little while before he did it. He saw what was going on and he put together a plan and he did it. He didn't lash out at the people. It wasn't anger that drove him. It was passion for God's house that drove him on. Scripture says, be angry and sin not. Sometimes you will be angry, but if you truly have a passion for God, you will not go into a rant and a rage and spit uh, uh, insults at people. It will not happen. 
if you are a child of God. But pastor, we're all sinners. No, we're not. We need to get that out of our vocabulary, our thinking. We are saved. We are a new creation. Now we still mess up. And the enemy is still out there trying to trip us up. But if we sin, not that we are sinners, but if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is pleading our case. Yeah, that's where he is. <laughs> the right hand of God. We need to get some passion because did you read it? Did you see it when I read it? It said for they, they had built the wall to have its size around the city for the people had worked with enthusiasm. Great passion. Hey, great things are happening. We're going to get this done. Yeah. So be wary of the pitfalls. Because they're going to come. Because any time we work for Jesus Christ, we have a tendency to start working under our own power. And when we do, this is what happens. This is the pitfalls. Because they, they were working. And it was strenuous and it was hard work. And the enemy was looking for an opportunity to pounce on them, to destroy them. And the, the very first pitfall that came along was grouchiness. They began to complain. They were started whining. Nehemiah brought the cheese out for them. They started complaining. They got grouchy. You ever see that happen? I'm the only one that's willing to work in the nursery. I'd like to sit in church sometime. Now, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, okay? I'm really not. I, I, I'm just talking about things I've seen other places. Because we have people that <laughs> and they just have such a joy working with our babies in the nursery. You need to talk to them. They really do. I'm pointing fingers at them. I'm just, I'm just using this because I've seen it other places because sometimes when we are doing something, we feel like we're the only one, just like <laughs> oh Elijah did. Lord, I'm the only one that cares about you. I'm the only one that wants to do anything at all. I'm the only one. And Jesus listens to it for a while and then he says, sit down. I've got people everywhere. You don't even know about the people I've got. You are not the only one. When people start complaining, they're getting trapped by the pitfalls along the way. Because the grouchiness then leads to weariness. They start getting tired. Pastor, I just, I'm burnt out. I need to step back. I just can't do this anymore. Someone else needs to take it on. I'm weary. And that happened to them in Galatians 6, 9. We read, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. Because at the just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Did you know that when we get tired and we're ready to throw our hands up and quit, we are quite possibly one word away from bringing someone to salvation in Jesus Christ. We are just one kind act away from bringing someone to a place of salvation with Jesus Christ because He is using us. When we are ready to throw up our hands and quit, we may be murdering someone's eternity. Do not grow tired of doing what is good. Just one more kind word. One more kind deed. One more prayer. One more hug. 
They might make a difference in eternity for someone. Never, ever give up. But that's where they were at. They were grouchy. They were weary. And then the anxiousness set in. They became very anxious. We're never going to be able to build this wall by ourselves. Pastor, I don't know why we even try. This church is never going to grow. Now I am. I have heard that since I've been here. So we need to be honest with ourselves. Maybe we are just a little tired. Philippians 4 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. <laughs> uh, reminds me of a chorus that my daddy used to sing. Why worry when you can pray? Trust Jesus, he'll be your stay. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Rest fully on his promise. Why worry, 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 worry when you can pray? You know, you know, on our own, we cannot rebuild. Not by might. Not by power. But by my spirit, saith the Lord. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be prudent. So we've got to make sure bills are paid. We've got to make sure that uh, things are taken care of. We've got to do all these things. We must be prudent. But we really don't need to worry about what the enemy is doing because we have Jesus. Now let's read on through the rest of the chapter. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemy heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. But from then on, only half my men worked while the other half stood guard with spears, shields, <coughs> excuse me, bows, and coats of mail. The leaders stationed themselves. Be- <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the, la- uh, the leaders stationed themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting their load and one hand holding a weapon. And the builders had a sword belted to their side. The trumpeter stayed with the to, with me to sound the alarm. Then I explained to the nobles and officials and all the people that the work is very spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. When you hear the blast of the trumpet, rush to wherever it is sounding, then our God will fight for us. We worked early and late from sunrise to sunset and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. That way they and their servants could help with guard duty at night and work during the day. During this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. My people, God's work sometimes is dirty work. I mean, you can't, you can't raise a garden if you don't get dirty. That's true. So here we are. We faced our enemy. What do we do next? We continue the work. We just keep going. So how do we continue? Well, the first thing we need to do is gather our weapons. 
before I read the scripture, when I first got to Hot Springs, one of the first people I met outside of the church was a man by the name of Doug Gully. Doug is on staff at uh, uh, Gospel Light, and uh, he's a Barnabas. And uh, I, I have opportunity to meet with him twice a week in two different pastor uh, groups that I am a part of since I've come here. And right after I got here, Doug says, I want to give you something. And he hands it to me. He says, do you know anything about the military challenge coins? I said, no, not really. He says, well, in the military they have challenge coins. And when you give someone a challenge coin, then every time you meet, you never know the person that gave it to you may pull his out of his pocket and you're challenged to pull yours out. It's part of a brotherhood. He said, well, I found challenge coins for Christians. He says, I give this to you and I want you to carry it with you everywhere you go. And I, and I find myself uh, reaching in my pocket because it's got, it's got some weight to it. And I reach in my pocket and, and I kind of just twirl, twirl it around in my hands because it reminds me of what's on this coin. What is there for me. What he is encouraging me to do. And it says... Put on the whole armor of God. Breastplate, helmet, shield, belt, sandals, sword. Every day when I reach in my pocket, I am reminded that I am to put on the armor of the Lord because what we are to do as God's people, if we're going to be victorious, is we must gather our weapons. And this is our weapons, Ephesians 6, 14-17, reading from the King James Version this morning. Stand therefore, having your lawns girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Every day we must dress ourselves in the righteousness of God in order to get out there and do battle against the opposition. Gather up your weapons. This is war, people. This is war. A great old hymn says, Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high His royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, His army shall He lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Wow, what we need to do to gather up our weapons and stand in the power and might of Jesus Christ. Because if we don't, there's another song that says, are we walking into the enemy's camp? Throwing our weapons down? Shedding our armor as we go, leaving them on the ground. We've got to be strong in His power and His might and prove to the enemy we are the army of the Lord and we've won the victory. Second thing we need to do, and it's my favorite, favorite line in the whole chapter. Nehemiah said, Remember the Lord. Can you imagine how powerful that really is? To just remember the Lord? To remember what He has done for you, what He has done for others? Think about that. When I, when I face something that seems overwhelming, if I stop and remember the Lord, I will remember that He is a powerful God. He's not just powerful, He's all-powerful. There's nothing with more power than God. Remember, what's, what's God done for you? 
Where were you five years ago? 10, 20, 30, 40, depending on how old you are. Stop and remember what God has done. Because remember, Nehemiah said, Y'all, when you hear the trumpet, everybody run there and God will fight. <laughs> he didn't say, You're going to fight. He said, God will do it. When we stop and remember the Lord, the battle is over. Because He has already won. When we stop, we remember, Oh, yeah, I don't have to fight this. I heard the trumpet. I ran to the trumpet. When the trumpet calls, obey. That's what another old song says. <laughs> and then, it frustrates the enemy. That's what it said. When the enemy learned that we had learned of their plans and that God had frustrated them, God frustrated the enemy. And God will frustrate your enemy. Because when we recognize who we are truly battling against, and when we face that opposition, and we stand, God will do the rest. We're going to close differently this morning. Because I'm going to challenge you. I am excited for the future. I've had some great conversations this week to see where God is truly working. And He is. But what I am asking you today that if you are willing to work on the wall, to rebuild, to remember the Lord, and if you are, would you stand? Father, we don't know the path, but we know the guide. As we take our stand today, wearing the armor of God, we trust you. to lead us and we will follow in Christ's name Amen you are dismissed go in the grace and peace of Jesus Christ